Hey everyone, this is Manly Badass here, and welcome back to Deathmark. Previously, we reached the climax of Chapter 6, and now we're off to confront Red Riding Hood. I go back inside Masquerade. A voice calls from the darkness if it was waiting for me. See, it flickers, because it's just an illusion. The true form is a spider. What are you telling me to do? The top floor in the room of masks. The top floor. The sixth floor was listed on the guide, but it was impossible to reach. The paintings. Red Riding Hood's figure melts silently into the elevator. As she does, the elevator's floor display begins blinking on and off erratically. The combination. You know it, don't you, sir? Her voice reverberates throughout the elevator. So she's telling me to go to her. But this combination. What in the world could that be? Alright. Ooh, they're all lit up. Huh. The spirit vanished into the elevator. I must be able to use the elevator to get to the top floor then. And the floor display began to blink on and off erratically. Is that some kind of hint? That word she used, combination. I start the elevator buttons. Maybe I'm supposed to push these in a certain combination. If I press the floor buttons in a certain order, I might be able to get to the sixth floor. What's the order? I've got no idea. The order is based on the the life cycle of the the mast, the masquerade wife. I've got to think. Like the cane would be the last one because that's like old age. There has to be a clue somewhere inside masquerade. Red Riding Hood mentions the top floor and the superiors, which so means the sixth floor. The buns only go to the fifth. I suddenly remember the word combination. It could be that the buns need to record the work. What should I press them in? I'm sure there's a clue in the hotel. So let's step out real quick. I want to see if we have some unique context for this dialogue here. It's a picture of a masked woman wearing a wedding gown. Marriage. Gazing at a man, so that would go before marriage, because that's meaning. So we're going to go that... That would be one, and that would be two. If we assume... Based on certain logic. That's not the actual number, I'm just using it to organize them in my head. It's a picture of a masked woman walking with a cane. That'd be the last one. It's a picture of a masked woman walking with a cane. Oh yeah, I forgot the whole... The thing it loops in. You gotta take the elevator up. Masquerade wife. Put you have a masculine running down a trail. Trail, man. And wedding. Okay. I have all the information I need now, because I already know which is the last one. By process of elimination. Well, let me save. Just in case it puts me into a boss fight as soon as I hit this. So we are on the, the fourth floor, and trail would be number one. 
because there's no man there. So she's running to the man. And then beating the man. And marriage. And I don't I forgot what the fifth one was. Um, but process of elimination either way. And then Kane. End of life. The other door opens and you know, it looks like one of the other rooms. A musty stench greets me. But that's not all. The smell is blood. Red Riding Hood's voice drifts on the wind. <laughs> I've been waiting for you. No, I'm... I doubt my words will reach her. But I feel like I have to at least say it. I'm not the one you respect. I'm not the one you're waiting for. When a ghost asks you if you're a god, you say yes! Liar. You always lie. I'm not lying. I'm really not. Here we go. Get the torch out! A scream splits the night. It's the same one I heard during the spider torture. St stop! Stop this! This won't accomplish anything. That's why, this time... I'm going to test you. From the ceiling, really, you cliche spider. Oh boy. We saw you earlier in the elevator, that's what you were. You actually look pretty cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna admit this. It's not so much scary or it's it's actually pretty like legit. And the spiders fly out of the darkness and start crawling over my body. Alright, the spiders are scary though. The swarm of spiders keep coming. Insectide! Shy! Sh I, I hastily pull out the insectide and pour it all over my exposed skin. But the spiders don't even react. Doomed! Wrong. A sharp pain runs from my neck. Ugh. My heart struggles violently, they keep beating. And then the darkness envelops me. Or is it the sprinklers? Shite! I take a massage around my bag, hold it against my body, and hit the switch. This worked before. The spiders start acting strangely. They all scramble away. Safe. Rerunning on out a gusty sigh. Floating white threads fly through the air from her mouth. She's trying to use her spider silk. Sprinkles this time. Jacket. Wooden horse head sounds so stupid it's gotta work. I hold the horse head over mine as protection. Strangely enough, the threads seem drawn to it and only wrap around the horse head. Safe. Did what was right. Villains go to hell. It's a lot of sight. <laughs> We're running with staring at me. 
Sir, come with me. The only thing that matters is your life. How do you know a person's worth? Shut up, shut up, shut up. Brianna it screams again. And then bending eyes glare at me. I look to you. Like a little sister to me. You met too late. You are too young. <laughs> what do you like about me? Your honesty. Survived. Everybody let's figure waivers and smashes through the window and off into the night. Huh? Just jump! The bustling sneak me heard out the window. I want my sweaty brow of my shirt sleeve. Something touches my cheek. Something's floating in the darkness. A Fred. Red Fred of fate? As I follow my eyes, I realize it's wrapped around my wrist. Yeah. Oh, whoa! Something yanks me toward the window. Hey. I brace my legs and try to resist. But all in vain. I'm thrown out to the night sky. Bega! I scream as I plummet. No, I should be rushing toward the ground. Just as I give up all hope. Mashita! Holy crap! A strong jolt makes me look up. A man struggles to hold on to my arm. His teeth gritting with effort. Mashita. Shut up and give me your other arm. Hurry up. Grab on to me. Right. He desperately tries to pull me up, and after what feels like an eternity of struggling, I make it over the ledge and tumble safely back inside the hotel. <sighs> the only sound that can be heard is our gas for breath as we sit in the darkness. Why did you ignore my orders? Master spits out words between wheezes. Sorry. This isn't the time to be making excuses. I might be better off shutting up. Idiot. Try putting yourself in my shoes. Is she... Gone. I think so. The window. I'm still trembling as I point to the broken window. She threw herself out on it. She might have been trying to take me with her. No, not you. That sir person. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Can you walk? Then let's go. Masha slowly stands and looks at me. Nicely done. That wasn't bad work for an amateur like you. And so began the Mashita Yashiki Detective Agency. Two paranormal cops. Solving the cases that others wouldn't take. With the loving mascot. Soon to be in 20 years, Mary. It stopped raining. The cool wind in my cheek hinted on him. I'm going to drop by and see Diamond. 
I'd like to see how the others are doing. Yeah. What? Hand me the car key. No, I can drive. Have you completely gone mad? Look at your hands. I glance down at them, only to suddenly realize they're still shaking. You just face down a spirit. You can't drive in that condition. The choice made for me, I take the key out of my pocket and toss it to Machita. The corner parking lot. Right. You rest here. His figure melts into the darkness. As I watch him go, I notice something down on the wet asphalt. It's... A spider. She jumped out the window and died. A dead spider. Huh. It lay there. Legs all curled up, almost as if... It was desperately trying to hold on to something. I gently pick the spider up. I wrap it in my handkerchief and put it in my pocket. The car right back is a blur. I said let Mashita's voice wash over me like background radio noise. I remember wondering if Red Riding Hood might have stolen a part of my soul. Before the investigation today, Moya tipped us off on that testimony, remember? That helped me connect the dots. I realized a teacher was wrapped up in the case. A teacher from a school near the hotel was arrested for breaking the law. That's... What does that have to do with anything? There was a non part in Ako's testimony. They were scared they'd be reported, but nothing ever happened. In other words, Esco never went to the police after talent to the teacher. But maybe more, she couldn't go. I frown and try to put the pieces together. I think I'm too spaced out as not making sense. You never make it as a detective. Can he just drop that? I don't plan on becoming one anyway. There's only one possible answer. The sir person that's could trust it so deeply was one of the masquerade's customers told you. What? I feel like I've been hit the side of the head. Now a pillow, more like a lead pipe. The one she sought salvation from ended up being a criminal. The definition of irony. Master glanced out the window and chuckles dryly. The bitter sound fits both our moods. It was a teacher in Nemora, the one mentioned in Akko's testimony. I saw a photo of him. He was thin, tall, that popular with students. Oh, I suppose. He glanced back at me from the mirror. You might say he wasn't too unlike you. Marsh suddenly tosses a file at me. Those are the research results. Look them over if you want to know more. Results. I flipped through the thick bundle of paper. Those have very well organized documents. It would have taken a long time to gather this amount of information. It hits me. Wait a second. Master just said that he connected the dots with the help of Moy's testimony. Which means he knew all this before we started our investigation tonight. You knew everything. I just said I put it all together when I heard the testimony. But I said not to tell you just in case. Why? If I had known, I could have... What would you have done? His tone turns mocking as he laughs. You would have just synthesized too much to let down your guard. You should be grateful I didn't. Masha leaves me with a research file and heads to Diamond's hospital. Now that I'm alone, I can't keep my three hospitalized friends out of my mind. But there's nothing I can do for them right now. I'm doing everything I can. I bolster myself with that information. I spread Masha's document on the table. I'm exhausted, but I feel like I need to go through them today. Who in the world was Red Riding Hood? 
If Monster was right, the truth should be right in front of me. I face Red Riding Hood on the sixth floor, where she had waited for me. I managed to drive her back, but she literally takes me with her until Monster saves me in the last second. He's furious with me for disobeying his orders. I'm given this research file in the hotel, and this is what it says. Esco telling to her homework teacher Nemura about the job is what started it all. Nemura proposed to Esco that they gather evidence first. I told you, see that also. And they arranged to meet at Masquerade that night. The only thing waiting for Esco there was art betrayal by the teacher she was in love with. It turned out that Nemora himself was one of the Masquerade's customers. No one knows what exactly happened to Esco. She was found wandering the streets in a red raincoat and immediately admitted to a facility. Unfortunately, her mental state was too far gone already, and she committed suicide by throwing herself from a sixth floor window of the hospital. The night she died was cold and raining just like today. Sixth floor, because the sixth floor is where it happened, too. The report has info Nemora as well. When he was arrested for other illegal activities, he ended up testifying about Masquerade as well. Having a partner wear all red was code that you were planning to use at the Lux Suite of the hotel. That could be the reason Esco wore that red raincoat that night. Not long after the trial, Nemora apparently hung himself in jail. I still probably think he was the one who did the spider torture. I feel like he was just that twisted. To add to like the, the, the whole tragedy of the situation. Must for today. And so the case surrounding the masquerade quietly comes to a close. Leaving an invisible scar on that dark street. The lives lost there will never return and neither will their trampled dignity. The only thing that saved that disaster that my friends survived. Your old Banshee and Show all regained consciousness after that. They got out of no lasting symptoms and are recovered enough to look, go back to their lives. Daimon concluded that the affliction inhibited the soul very much like the mark. In that case, maybe Red Riding Hood was finally released from that horrible nightmare. Released? Just like the spirits that gave people the mark. If anything good came about because of this case, then that would be it. A damn clock. A week later. Mashita suddenly shows up on my doorstep. Before I even open my mouth, he pulls out an envelope and tosses it on the table. I'm here to deliver this. It's a reward. Take it and get out of here. I didn't do it because I want a reward. Listen, it's money. Free money. Take it. How should I know? The client asked me to do this, that's all. I did my job and hand over. The rest is in your hands. Damn, what a pain. People are not tipping free money in this day and age. What does it come to? Mashita turns and curses under his breath. I can still hear everything he says. That's all you came for? No, there was one other thing. I learned something from this past case. And what's that? There's something about you. You're suited for this work after all. That again. Sorry, but I'm done. No more. I keep trying to get out and they keep pulling me back in. Just hear me out. There have been more mysterious cases it's like the masquerade popping up lately. Dang it, Mary. You really were the Ghostbuster catalyst. I thought it might be Mark related, but it seems like I was wrong. He stops for a moment and then mutters. Yayaki Yagyo. A monstrous parade. Have you heard anything about it? A Hiyaki Yagyo. Night parade of a thousand demons. Yeah, sure, and ghost stories. But he's clearly asking about something that's happening in the real world. No, I haven't. That's so. I figured you, of all people. Forget it. First he asks me, then he tells me to forget it. He only cares about his own bottom line. She... Mashita glances briefly at the sofa in the corner of the room. Might have known something. So you want my help? 
The old lady Yasuoka seems to think you could do some good. I do too. That's all I wanted to say. No, wait. I have one last bit of advice. Quit doing stuff like that. Like what? You picked up that dead spider, didn't you? You saw. Just out of the corner of my eye. That's why darkness follows you. Your ancestors probably had pity on her too. Living in the dead can't coexist. If you try to accept their feelings, you'll just end up getting pulled in. Even so... Mashida might be right, but even so... If someone doesn't accept them, they'll stay like that forever. That's not something I want to bear. Mashida just snorts derisively like usual. <laughs> He leaves, closing the door behind him. That marks the end of the case and the end of one chapter in my story. But someday in the future, I can't help but think that door will be thrown open again. Sequel bait! But no, seriously. Because Mashita brings up the night parade, and the night parade, if you know your yokai and spirits, is extremely important. Um, it's usually led by one specific yokai. I forgot the name exactly, but it's the one with the really big head. It's kind of like the lord of the yokai. So, that, that was sequel bait, basically. It's like saying, like, well, we defeated Mary, but now all its yokai are going to appear, and you're going to eventually join me to be a paranormal cop. Like, obviously, it's not something that's going to come out right away, but they left the door open in case they ever want to revisit the series. And this is obviously a world that does have a lot of supernatural stuff going on. And it just moved back to the beginning of the game. So that is the end of the game. Like, that's the end. Then. No credits. The credits came earlier. So, I mentioned sequel bait. And funny enough, I actually looked it up um, out of curiosity as I was going through the art book that I came with my limited edition of uh, Deathmark. And... There actually already is a sequel announced, and it was announced last year in 2007... No, 2018, rather. Uh, the game came out in 2017, Death Market is, but this game was announced uh, in around April 2018, and it's called NG, which stands for No Good, and it is a confirmed sequel to Death Mark, uh, and it's, I'll, I'll go over it a little more, but it, it does actually quite literally flow into the, uh, the yokai... Night Parade thing that was mentioned here. So this that DLC, which is part of the main game for the American release, was actually sequel bait. So, that explains that. Uh, and the art book does also go into Mary's backstory uh, pretty much. So, I'll go into that um, after I get the, the bad ending here. All right, so let's go for the band end. So since we've already kind of seen this dialogue, unless I see something new, I'm uh, not outright skip. I kind of go through it a little faster. This is the one where we have to make a different change. Extremely attractive.
kill that traitor together. Red Running Hood's figure wavers then. Smashes through the window and off into the night. She just jump. The bustling city can be heard out the window. I wipe my sweaty brow with my shirt sleeve. I think this ending is mostly the same. Something touches my cheek. Something's floating in the darkness. A friend. As I follow my eyes, I realize that it's wrapped around my wrist. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm gonna skip forward because I think this is all the same. I think I can kind of pause this scene right here. Because this scene kind of hits me. Like, the whole story is not extremely emotional, like, death mark in general. There's a few instances. But this one in particular, when when I think of the Masha to end dialogue, but, like, there's a little bit of a poetry here, and, because, even me, like, when I see this scene, like, I feel bad for the dead spider myself. I, I'd be probably be tempted to pick it up. Because, I'm, you know, I'm invincible. I wouldn't go with Swindale kill me if they wanted to. Uh... Because you would, you would feel pity for the girl, right? You would feel sad for her situation, because she did nothing wrong. She became a spire demon and started murdering random people after her. That's wrong, but, you know. So it's sort of that temptation. You take the dead spire, and you think, you know, nothing's going to happen with it. It's like out of respect, but who knows? That Majda gave that liberation at the end. Like, you shouldn't do that. And he brings up that line about the dead shouldn't meld with the living. And that's true, you know. Like, he's, he's right. And Masha's usually hyper-cynical and just sarcastic, but he has that little poetic line about that. And it shows a little bit of character development and, um... Not necessarily character development, more of like a betraying of character. Where he kind of does... He actually is thinking and has somewhat of a care for the world and things. Uh, to the point where that line was actually quoted in the, the art book. So they made a point to mention that line. So, there was some significance to that, and I guess the sequel maybe will come back to that a bit, a little bit, but... This was a well-directed, well-directed scene. I, I felt some real emotion here. Especially right here, like, it lay there, all legs all curled up, almost as if... It was desperately trying to hold on to something. It's really sad. That's sad to me. Alright, we'll skip ahead. And so the case surrounding Masquerade quietly comes to a close, leaving an invisible scar on the dark street. The lives lost there will never return, neither will their trampled dignity. I lost something as well. The royal banshee shows conditions worsened after that. They were immediately transferred to a larger hospital. Because of that, they nearly escaped death, but their psyches will remain forever damaged. According to Daimon, the chance of them recovering, ever recovering are very thin. To have this happen to people who were only trying to lend me a hand. Maybe it would have been better if I just died from the fallout Masquerade's window. I struggle to get through each and every day. If this is Red Riding Hood's revenge, then I can admit that it's effective. A week later. And then, I think the rest of this is actually all the same. They drop that sequel bait. So anyway, while I go through here, I'll just come back to the thing I was talking about. Uh, even when you, like, because Masha brings up Mary and, like, your ancestors and whatnot. And Mary, like, I read their backstory in the art book. Like I said, I'll go over that. Even she has tragic kind of past of origin. I mean, all these ghosts do. So he mentions it was kind of the fault of the past Kujo, so they took pity on Mary. And that little bit of pity, you know, turned out bad. Because, you know, the dead aren't supposed to interact with the living. And the dead should, like, mind its own business and stop cursing us. Because it's not our fault. So he has a point. But once again, like I said, Barry is kind of scary. Because dolls are scary. Like, even when I was a kid, I was scared of dolls. But... I think a lot of people would have that temptation, that pity would come up, where you'd think, I gotta put the spirit at rest. I just can't, like, toss away the doll. When you should probably just burn and toss away the doll. But 
Anyway, on to post commentary. Hey everyone, this is Manly Badass Zero here, and that is the end for Deathmark. And using these post commentaries, I just talk about some of the story parts and um, my thoughts of the game. But before we get into those specific things, I'm actually going to go over the lore of the game. I mentioned this and some other things about Deathmark. Um, to start off, before I get into the lore, because there's some context that needs to be given here, uh, I'm going to show off the limited edition of Deathmark, which. Okay, so you have the slipcase, you know, slipcase. What do you expect? You have the game there, obviously. But the slipcase goes around this pretty cool box. It's kind of a light shining because I have a bright white light over here. But I'm gonna try to get it focused in. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it's not the not the most amazing special edition or anything, but it's not too expensive. Um, and you catch it comes with <laughs> death mark tattoos. Speaking of that not shining in the light not very effective there here we go uh the death mark soundtrack yeah uh and death mark I, I don't think it really had any s truly standout this songs which i would want to listen on to a soundtrack um the soundtrack was good you know but it was more of a uh, it was more of a soundtrack you get what i'm saying like it wasn't like undertale where the song in itself is kind of carrying a scene <laughs> It's more like an accessory soundtrack. Let anyway, me put that down there. But the main important part of the Deathmark Collector Edition is the Deathmark Art Collection book. And this book is not just a little mini art book. It's full of some pretty damn important lore stuff. Namely, Mary's entire backstory, which is not told in the game. So they have a backstory. They just didn't pull it out of nowhere. And the reason for it not being in the game is, in my personal theory, is that there is there is a sequel death mark i'll get into that later but basically mary's on ice and this is a series i'm not sure how many it's gonna be it's gonna be three games or four games or five games who knows but mary's on ice they're gonna reuse mary at some point and as a little bonus you can find out the backstory if you read basically the manual not the literal manual but it's, it's a trope term but before that they're gonna want at some point reuse mary for some climatic part with yashiki and Mashita, I'm assuming, and that's when they'll probably like give Mary some character. They might even change some of this backstory. You know, it'll probably be some time before that's ever released. So we do have an official backstory and origin for Mary. So I'll, I'll read that. Uh, I'm not going to show all the art book. I'll, I'll show some of the images here, based on some of the context that uh, of what I'm reading. But for the most part, you know, I don't want to uh, basically pirate the art book for the internet on my video. So. So first, I'm gonna go over the character biographies. We'll go over Mary's backstory last, because it's last in the book. Uh, I'm gonna give kind of an abbreviation here. So let's... Y Kazuo Yashiki Mazumune Kujo, who is our main character, who has not changed too much from his prologue. And his description is, the previous head of the Kujo family, he went missing during an incident traveling abroad where he was searching for answers about Mary. Upon his return home, he inside investigated supernatural phenomena and it was during this time that he obtained the mark and lost all of his memories. The man once known as Mazamune did not have as much spiritual power as his sister, Saya, but he was good with his hands. He wasn't known to be much of a people person either. So pretty much what we pretty much know about Yashiki, for, for a self-insert anyway. And we have Initial Concept, which is the prototype version. He's remained mostly the same since the Initial Concept stage. He's a slightly upperworldly, thin middle-aged man. Some early concept art went a slightly different direction with him, making him have a more sickly cursed look. Uh, and he also had a fedora at one time. <laughs> That's about it. And age-wise, he is age 35 to 45, so we don't have a specific age. But we do know that he is mid-age, which is usually pretty unusual for um, anime or Japanese video games or anything. He's pretty rare to have a mid-age character like that. So Mary, and they actually have like a little height difference comparison in the book for our main character. Height 4'1", if you want to know how tall Mary is, 11 pounds, they had to put that weight in. A ball joint doll obtained by the Kubjo family during the Taisho period, 1912-1926. She was loaned to the army for the Heavenly Buddha project until a tragedy occurred in the facility. A Nenji Butsu was encased in her body in order to suppress her powers. Initial concept. From the start, she was always going to be cursed living doll. We decided she was some evil princess from another country. There's also a white version of her dress. 
which is actually in the art book here. That's for when Mary captures you from the bad end, and then she forces you to have a marriage with her. You know, before she kills you. Sayakujo, who we see very little of. We see a very kind of obscure death CG, but we actually have a full character design in the art book. Um, the bark location, which is in the back of her neck. And um, a cute CG in here of Yashiki basically combing her hair out, which shows that they actually did have a pretty close relationship. So they weren't just kind of standoffs as siblings, they were pretty tight. Sayakujo, uh, age 33, once again, another older character. A medium who works as a spirit healer. After getting the mark from Hanahiko while investigating supernatural phenomena, she fought her fate by researching with her brother for a ritual to cleanse the Nenjibutsu. She also reached out and searched for other market bearers, but in the end she became another victim of the mark. Initial concept. Her details were nailed down until the end, much like the protagonist. As her brother's name is Mazumune, after the famous sword, we ultimately decided to name her Saya, after the Japanese word for sheaf. Next character, fan-favorite Mashita. Satoru Mashita, age... 27, by the way, so he's actually almost half the age of Yashiki, and he's 5'8", and Miyashiki's about 5'11", so he's also shorter. I just thought that was a little interesting because Mashita seems a little bit more aggressive within the storyline, so you would almost think he's older the way he acts, but um, he's actually uh, quite a bit younger. An ex-detective who stayed at the mansion after his mark disappeared in order to learn the truth about the Honeybee family. Apparently, undercover detective killed by the cult was his mentor and good friend. That was also where he picked up his preference for alcohol and smoking. He enjoys blowing smoke in the faces of non-smokers while expounding on the numerous other health risks in the world, which is mainly ghosts, in this world at least. Initial concept. He started as an officer who killed a culprit in self-defense, and then decided to continue using his job position to legally kill others. It was rather extreme. We decided to change it in the end, but maybe he's so interesting because of that shadowy past. So there's gonna be a trend here, and as I go over the profiles, you'll notice it, where a lot of the characters had more extreme profiles, and they were toned down, possibly because they thought maybe they were too edgy, and also possibly because they thought that it would kind of distract from the, the main storyline, which is, you know, the horror and the aspect. Okay, so Moe Watanabe, pretty much the same. A boisterous young woman who snuck into a school to get a scoop to submit to an occult magazine only to end up getting the mark from Hanahiko. Excessively imaginative, her diary is full of reality mix of fiction. Despite her interest in the occult, she's more of a scaredy cat and constantly shri shrieked while out on investigations. Initial concept, she hasn't changed much from initial design. She was always an overly curious, active young girl who loves daydreaming and the occult. We would know she had a preference for older, intelligent men right from the start. So take that as you will, that last line. Uh, Tsukasa Yoshida, next one. And that, their design is actually almost exactly the same. They had longer hair when they were younger. Well, not younger. Prototype. Age 10. 4 5. A young boy from prestigious private school. He looks down on others, but he's simply honestly evaluating them instead of trying to be mean. He works to fulfill his parents' expectations, so it causes him a lot of stress. He's evened out after surviving his Mark ordeal. Perhaps meeting a trustworthy adult had a greater effect on him than he realized. Initial concept. At first we made him the perfect honor student in front of the adults. But in truth, a horrible mean reeling of bullies, which would obviously end with him being cursed. But eventually, he wound up being just a pretty honest kid. So Yoshida was originally a bully, and then afterwards, I think you can see a little bit of remnant of that with their crazy eyes when they get angry. <laughs> so Sho Nagashima, uh, one of the characters I didn't care too much about. Okay. Oh, also, Sho is 5'10", so Sho also is taller than Mashita. Another little interesting trivia thing. A delinquent who repeated a grade, he went wild after having to quit the baseball club due to an injury. The mark and his brush of death may have left him let him mature a bit. He's recently joined a neighborhood baseball team and is acting like a proper member of society. His baby is his two-stroke off-road dirt bike. His dream is to buy a 750cc motorcycle, so he digitally works hard at a local bar to save money. Initial concept, he was always going to be a hothead delinquent who repeated grade and caused trouble for a baseball team. But partway through, we added his fear of the supernatural, so they made him more of a coward. So for that, mainly the same character. Next is Christy Aramura, age 37. I'll come back again, once again, to that trait that a lot of the characters are mid-aged, which is um, 
very rare. Like, once for fiction that comes from Japan. At least pop culture fiction, anyway. A uh, former news anchor who went to the forest to kill herself, but instead wound up involved in the supernatural. It is later revealed that she got her mark when she entered a phone booth. She has good spiritual sensitivity and often sees spirits, which could be due to her diverse heritage spanning multiple countries. So, Christy Aramura is basically... She's mixed. Uh, hence the name Christy. And incidentally, she doesn't really have a black belt in Taekwondo, but she is a certified level 2 spa expert. Initial concept. A person blacklisted from entertainment and journalism for situations revolving around improper remarks and fooling around. Our initial idea had her egotistical and crafty, but later we shifted her to have a more weak, timid side and added in her contemplation of suicide. So Christy was more... smug, basically. And they kind of added that more melancholic laid-backness to her. Here we go. Uh, my personal not favorite. <laughs> Eita, Eita Nakamatsu. Otaku guy. Age 33. A nerdy guy who lives the manga-like experience of a cute little girl treating as her older brother. To try to be a better role model, he went to the employment office to get a nice job at a warehouse. Christy's wary of his relationship with Suzu and keeps a close eye on him. He seems to only want to act like a good big brother. He still regularly visits occult BBSs, of course. Like two channel. Initial concept, and here's here's one of the ones that was much more extreme. A neat who thinks of himself as an internet famous inventor. Ato was originally a horrible, creepy pedophile who was popular with children. But in the end, we decided to make him a more harmless young man than anything else. So that's never one of those basically what I was saying where they toned down a lot of the character tropes and traits because I feel like they thought it would probably be too grim dark and probably a little too distracting. Um, but you can kind of see the skeleton of some of their writing in there. So Ito was just made into like an awkward nerd from what he originally was. Suzu Mormia, a young girl with complicated family circumstance. Her mother converted to Buddhism and her father left them. Surprisingly mature, she still treats Ito like an older brother. Thankfully, after her Mark incident, her parents' relationship was restored. And the letter she sent to Sensakuyo Mansion says that things are steadily improving. Initial concept. She loves animals, but hates people. After her parents' divorce, she found it even harder to trust adults. We initially had a strange idea to make her despair in humanity, but ended up scrapping it. So, Susie was supposed to be a little bit more... And they made her more of just kind of a... Overly mature um, child, basically. Ai Kashiwagawa, the idol, who has a lot of <laughs> prototype sketches, but pretty much the same design. Also, they have an art of her dabbing. Lead idol of a group Love and Hero. She obtained her mark during filming for a supernatural TV show and went to Kujo Mansion on the recommendation of the acquaintance. Yasuoka. She worked hard to get into college during breaks and work, but had to temporarily stop taking classes due to being too busy. After the commotion caused by her sneaking away during the mark incident, she's been assigned a staff member who keeps an eye on her at all times. Initial concept. She was originally a local idol from HC who dreamed of becoming a Cat's Eye member, which I, I don't really know. But once we decided the game was in the 90s instead of decades earlier, we had to change that. Maybe we didn't change it enough. So, that's when I won. The final line, I also remember the same thing of uh, take it as you will. Daimon. Age 44. Six feet tall, by the way. So he's the tallest um, male character, anyway, in the cast. A man who's the very image of an overworked doctor. After the Mark incident, he's been busy getting a memorial belt for the underground shelter. He doesn't say it in so many words, but it seems it was quite shocking to learn his grandfather participated in the insanity there. His unprofessional hairstyle is a memento from his younger days. Initial concept. Diamond was originally going to be an unlicensed genius doctor who had worn himself out. But now he has a proper license. That meant he came to ground saying, I promise I won't fail. So Diamond actually was kind of the fictional uh, fictional character, doctor type, like Blackjack and you've seen like in TV shows and whatnot. So pretty much the same, but a little closer to his trope originally. Monica Hero, a researcher for a major pharmaceutical company. She's proud to be a devout believer in cold hard science, but in reality she's a mess. Her excessive fear of the supernatural could be a manifestation of her guilt over performing numerous animal experiments. She's had the same hairstyle and glasses since high school. She loves sake, but when she's drunk, she goes wild. Age 28. So, older than Mashita. 
funny enough, by one year. Initial concept. She was originally a mad scientist, mad old scientist who killed, who liked to kill guinea pigs while cackling. They are blank cells, so be swear word, basically. The terrifying Zukawa beat Hiro at her own game, so she was toned down. So, Hiro was originally closer to, to uh, Zukawa. They were actually pretty similar characters to Ridge 4, and they toned her down because they can't have too many cooks. Banshee Ito, age 66, height 5'5. A mysterious old man who decided to call Underground Shelter home around the time the cannon soldiers started wandering around. No one has a clue who he is. But he must have spiritual powers, or at least spiritual sight, or else he likely wouldn't still be alive. And incidentally, according to Myth, Banshees are female specters. Whenever someone points it out to him, he says, The one I spotted in English long ago was male. Uh, I, I guess you might be saying England, because I... And just saying like a funny way, or it's an actual typo. Initial concept, a homeless man of unknown nationality. His appearance and personality are essentially the same, even the way he cries. Ask Mr. Tenek Takanaka if you want to see a live reenactment. So, Banshee... There's like a little bit of lore thing where it says unknown nationality. So they, they didn't have to say that. They could have just said... They could have just left it out and we just assume he'd be Japanese. But the fact they say that, and if we interpret the one word saying English as England... Uh, once again, Banshee could be mixed. Uh, he could be another Asian race. He could be, uh, you know, it could be anything. But I, I think the implication is that Banshee's basically a world traveler. He's age 66, which is a funny number to pick for his age. So, he's a mysterious figure. They haven't really gone and given us any backstory about him or his origin or his family links. Maybe in a sequel, we'll, we'll go we return to Banshee a little bit. Uh, and Toako Yasuyoka, age 71, a famous fortune teller with a shop in Ginza. Before Sai consulted her about the mark, her last contact to Kujo's was before her falling out with Murasame, the second last head of the family. Whenever asked what was the argument was about, she simply replies, something stupid. The general assumption that it must have been about money. Money. Initial concept, we had her as a great fortune teller named Mi Miwa, with an amazing aura at first. But that didn't feel quite right, so we changed her name to Bifune and gave her supernatural powers. That didn't feel right either. So we finally settled on a more Neo-Confucian Yasuoka. So, she was more overt, and, you know, they made her more of... Comparatively normal, anyway. And then just two quick small things here for Daisuke, uh, who was the security guard who died, and Masao, who was the random salary man who died. So Daisuke is... He stayed pretty much the same since the beginning, but we like to ask you remember how horribly he died. <laughs> or ever he was murdered. Or rather, was murdered. Despite doing nothing wrong, he's a true victim in all of this. And Masao is, when we tried picturing the kind of people who might kill themselves, we thought there might be similarities with those who commit domestic violence. Actually, Shimi O was like that in life, too. So that's another thing of, uh... Being how you want to interpret that, that's a little interesting line. So the next part of the book is about the ghosts. And... So Hanahiko, the ghost of a young boy who died due to excessive abuse. He became a plant-like monster because of the herbal medicine involved in his death and from the Hana in his name, which means flower. I think someone in the comments actually mentioned this. His precious memories with his mother are full of him wearing skirts and dresses, so his appearance is similar to a girl. He hasn't changed much since his conception, but the details surrounding his death were hammered out during game development. There's nothing we know too much, but you get kind of the concept of why the poison ivy kind of... Uh, aspect. Next is Shimio, a lunatic who created a suspicious non-profit group that claimed it would release its members from pain and guide them to a promised land. In the end, he had all members commit mass suicide. However, he failed to kill himself and, due to the curse placed on the forest by his horrible deed, became an undead monster. As he was the only one who failed to take the promised journey with his family, he's painfully lonely. We like players to take a special note of the more pleased look of satisfaction on his face while he's at the table of Masao Kimura. So, I actually did point that out, actually. Um, I said, well, he has a smile on it. It's like he's just chilling and having a beer. Next is Hanayome. Oh, they actually give a height for it. It's apparently 6'5". I'm assuming that's with a long neck. A tragic woman who was kidnapped and assaulted, which led to her ending her life and subsequently becoming a monster. 
As she commits suicide by hanging herself, her neck stretches below her veil and her face has become inhuman. A special mention goes to her fiancé and her beloved dog, Genta. Or Genta. They slaughtered those responsible in a terrifying act of revenge. Aside from the cannon soldier, the Tris Trio has created more victims than any other spirit. And then we go to Zukawa. Uh, one of the more interesting chapters, but as far as direct ghosts... So-so. I guess it was supposed to be, supposed to be a little bit surreal. Uh, let's see. A gloomy girl who grew into a twisted adult. She chose to throw her humanity away and be reborn as a monster. Afterward, her insanity only deepened as she probably believed had surpassed all humans. Except me, of course. But the mystery as to why she chose a pig, snake, and ostrich, I guess it was human, to comprise her transcendental form. The pig in particular was a simple farm animal, additional proof to how insane she was. Next is Cannon Soldier. A curse occurred in the middle of a highly unscientific experiment to make a human weapon, creating a half-spirit, half-weapon monster. The indiscriminate massacre committed after its birth was covered up and explained as simply a tragic experiment-related accident. If this weapon had been mass-produced and put on the battlefield, the war would have ended very differently for Japan. And then Red Riding Hood, as I call it. And we actually have a full sketch of the, the sprite for the monster form, which we don't see in the actual game. A girl who tried to expose a crime, but was abducted and tortured by someone she trusted who ended up being involved. Completely and utterly crushed emotionally, she committed suicide and regretfully became a spirit. The strange torture she endured involved spiders, therefore she took on the form of a mythical Jorogumo. The episode was originally going to end with the protagonist sympathizing with her fate, but we ultimately change it so it closes the Mashita berating him for it. So there's a little bit of that left. Oh, here we go. Mary, Spirit of Wrath. The doll passed down for generations as Kujo family heirloom transformed to a monster by the wrath and hatred residing inside her. The goal revealed by her true nature was to carry out unprecedented, indiscriminate slaughter. But over time, her various machinations have warped into an abominable game meant to lessen her boredom. Incredibly perverse, she still somehow holds the loving heart of a maiden. So we're going to skip ahead, and we're going to go right to Mary's backstory. Which is the important part. Okay, so here's Mary's backstory. History. During the Tengyo period, 938 uh, through 947, the head of a general who died in battle was put on display in the capital. But one horrible day, the head suddenly came alive, flew east into the Kanto region, and plummeted into the Toshima district of Musashi province effectively cursing the heart of modern-day Tokyo. But some say the head fell before it reached its final destination. Instead, it landed on the western edge of current Tokyo in a place called K Village in the Tama District. The village was heavily cursed with a terrible plague, vengeful ghosts and other disasters. The local Shinto priests successfully suppressed all of it, but the curse strengthened every time a person's heart ran wild until finally, after a hundred years, the dead walked upon the earth on a night of pandemonium. It spread from K Village to the surrounding areas, spreading the eastern edge of Musashi province. So I'm not sure that has to do with the night parade at all, but it's a, uh, it might have something to do with it, maybe. But you know, you, if you look at like yokai stories, you see like a lot of stuff like that in their past. In the Muromachi period, 1346 from 1573, this matter weighed heavily on the one controlling the Kanto region, so he mobilized the Shinto priests to suppress the situation. They struggled mightily and found hard, but in the end, the only one option came to light. It was suggested that if the power of Japan's gods could not restrain the curse, then perhaps it could be fought with the power of some other land's gods. Many mediums from foreign countries were gathered, but the situation, situation was still unable to be contained. In the midst of this chaos, a young girl blessed with the divine powers appeared. Her name was never recorded, but it was said she drifted in from the west, her beauty beyond compare, with white hair and blue eyes. The shogunate and priest spoke of the gathered mediums, and it was decided that the best course of action would be to sacrifice this girl, who would obviously look like Mary, the sacrifice ritual was a success, and nearly all the supernatural events afflicting Musashi province seized. Half a century later, a strange paranormal occurrence began happening in Cape Village, with people gaining an odd scar on their bodies, only to suddenly die for inexplicable reasons. Those who feared that this could be the revival of the age-old curse abducted people gifted with spiritual powers from all over and managed to stop it again with a human sacrifice. After that, the ritual was performed every 50 years. People of high spiritual power gathered in Cape Village and made to live there always under threat of being the next potential human sacrifice. As time passed, the modern age was approached, the sacrifice ritual was altered. Now an elaborate living doll was created for sacrifice and infused with spiritual power. 
One of the dolls created was one made in a western workshop and modeled after the original sacrifice victim. It was highly prized as it contained enough power to seal the curse within itself, something none of the other dolls could do. The families that performed the ritual were the ones who controlled the dolls, and the practice was passed on to the next head of the household. But those who had knowledge of all this died in the recent world war, with the notes detailing the legend destroyed in a fire. The history of the dolls and the customs surrounding them were all lost, leaving only the dolls themselves. More time passed, and now we finally reach the present day of 1990X. So, you know, just before uh, Mega Man X, you know, burst out and the Zero Virus or something. <laughs> The ancient VK village is now known as H-City, and the well-known family resides there in the mansion. Is there a doll in the shape of a beautiful young lady awakens along with an ancient curse and the sinister grudges of untold sacrificial victims? Shortly thereafter, rumors pop up all over the city about a mark of death. So that is Mary's backstory. So Mary is basically a sacrificial doll to emulate a ritual that sacrificed Aji people, and she's modeled after a, uh, a blonde, blue-eyed girl with spiritual power that was sacrificed a long time ago in Japan. And I'm assuming that might be the dominant personality, but she's an allegation of a lot of pissed off ghosts, basically. She's she's a hive mind, I guess. Time period. The old curse history fades into the past, and the story starts in 1990X. At first, I didn't want to make it so removed from present day, but that time period makes it easier to include spirits and urban legends. It was a time when no one knew the Loch Ness monster was fake, and the internet wasn't available. Back then, when unexplained weird or scary things happened in the neighborhood, who are you going to call? The only one I hear about was for the news or word of mouth. That's why the setting is in the 90s when IT hardly existed, cell phones were just in their early stages, and that was only a cluster of bulletin boards. That only a certain subset of PC users accessed. It was a time of dreams, when the turn of the century was still in the future, and Nostradamus' prophecy of the great king of Anglomois had yet to come. So this is just all director commentary here. The game is set in H City, which is of course based in Hachijo City in western Tokyo, where a company experience is located. But to make it more supernatural, we create a large Han forest based off the Aoki Yahara Suicide Forest, which is much further west. Well, to be honest, the Tama region has plenty of haunted areas as it is. And here is the original idea was to make it a horror RPG, which is the remnants of, obviously, instead of an adventure game. But regardless, it was always going to be a horror game, so naturally set in a mansion. But after we decided the story would have the protagonist returning home after losing his memories, we switched it to more of an adventure game. I remember my staff getting angry because they fought combining amnesia pr protagonists in a shady western mansion was too fantastical, and creating a scary atmosphere for a horror adventure game would be too difficult. Plus, some of the RPG elements remained in the fact that the supporting characters all had very specific roles. So they're grounded more in reality, we eventually end up with the same characters we have now. So for better or worse, thanks to all the scrapped characters, the current cast end up with my extremely ended up with extremely unique personalities. My personal favorite is Aeta. The spookiest of the supernatural. We had to make the players and ourselves feel scared, so I wondered every day about why everyone finds ghosts and supernatural events so terrifying. So I tried tapping into very, my rational imagination. The very existence of ghosts is already irrational, with no scientific basis. But that's not what's important. The dead kill the living indiscriminately, which means their hatred or revenge isn't targeted to one specific person. Anyone who runs into a spirit would end up killed. This is so terrifying to me that I don't even want to think about it, but those kinds of irrational deaths do actually happen, and even if the killer dies, the hatred and sadness doesn't just dissipate. There's a haunted house kind of place where ghosts of that sort turn into vengeful spirits for the power of divine wrath. The premise of the game is to have the player come around each city pretending to be part of a horror story, but why did we do it? We want everyone to use the spirits and stories we create as stepping stones to expand their imaginations. All of us are different, but everyone can use their imaginations to grasp that unexpected answer and to relate to all the insane contained resentment. I hope that feeling slowly boils into terror. So I do have to say I'm disappointed that the setting isn't more ordinary and relatable, so I'll try to focus on that more next time. And after that is some stuff about the sequel. Uh, not text, just some art. So that is the background lore and some of the trivia from the art book. Uh, basically explains quite a bit. Like I said, I feel like they pulled some of it, specifically the Mary part, because I can be using it in a later game. And um, like I said, also there is a sequel, and I mentioned I was going to talk about that. And the sequel is called... It's actually in the book here. Anyway, I think it's like NG, yeah. NG, no good. So what's the abbreviation for it? NG, no good. And it is a direct sequel to Death Mark, but does not star the previous main characters. So it's a new cast. It's a overall younger cast, and the theme is Outlaws. So the main character is a younger character who is a... Uh, basically, he's a punk, does a lot of street fighting. He's looking for his sister who's been spirited away. 
And it does have to do with the whole March of a Thousand Demons, the yokai starting to appear everywhere, and there's stuff going on. Uh, and the rest of the cast are um, basically shady people like Yakuza, uh, and so on. So it's Outlaws versus the Supernatural. It's same game, they said, and it's supposed to be a refined version of it. It came out in July of this year, and it has not been translated yet. So, and there's no plans, I think... Maybe they're thinking about behind the scenes, but there's no plan so far for a Western release. Uh, but the main thing is, is that they said they've refined and approved the gameplay. That it's supposed to be a little bit more down to earth and kind of urban per se. They didn't say urban, but that's what I feel like they were trying to imply. Like it's normal people, daily lives, not so much a kind of melancholic older cast anymore. And the game has amped up the horror. In fact, it's extremely gory. Like, have you fought? Corpse Party for a commercial release game was gory and tra traumatic looking. This thing puts out to shame, and I've seen some of the promotional CGs. I'll show you one here, and this is not a spoiler because it's all over their marketing. Like it's right on their website, so I'm assuming it's not important. I think it's just a image that's supposed to show what happens if one of your party member dies. Like you fail, kind of like you can't fail. Uh, Death Mark, for example. So. The game is extremely gory, and this is one of the lighter scenes in the game. It's, it's completely... The, a lot of the monster designs are much more supernaturally surreal. Uh, and frankly, the whole thing is really horrifying. So they, it looks like they took off the kind of handlebars, and they're going all out with this one. So people who complained about no real graphic death CGs, you, you got it in this one. And let me tell you, you really got it. I, I poked around a Japanese playthrough about spoiling myself just to get an idea what this game was trying to offer. Um, and, and frankly, there's some really, really out, I, think of it this way, I've played a lot of horror VNs, you know, ones that aren't necessarily on my channel from, like, the past, uh, and this is probably one of the goriest ones I've seen. More gory than gore horror show. Let's think of that way. <laughs> that, that title alone should be telling you, like, how gory this is. So, I'm looking forward to the sequel. Um, if you like Deathmark, I definitely recommend... Frankly, going to buy the game. It's on the Switch or the PS4. It's a console game. There's no PC release. Um, you know, go support it. Ideally, even if you watch this playthrough, maybe, you know, even vocally support. Show axes that, you know, there's a fan base developing here and there's a lot of demand. Maybe, you know, we want to see the sequel in the West. Uh, hopefully, it would not get censored. But usually, usually, America, they don't care too much about violence. Um, Usually they only sense for sexual things, kind of like with the spider part, I guess. Um, so hopefully that, that wouldn't occur. But yeah, so that's it for my summary of the story and the lore and everything and talking about the sequel. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick review of the game, I guess. Um, but basically, I like Deathmark. It's not the greatest kind of adventure game visual novel. It's not a true visual novel. It's not a true adventure game. It's kind of halfway there. Um, but it, it's very consistent. And I'm just gonna say, like, there, and hence, since there was never a point where I felt quite bored, or like, oh man, what's gonna, get, what's gonna get over with? It does drag a few times where it kind of backtracks too much. Maybe the sequel will kind of fix that. Um, but for the most part, every time, it's kind of like, it's like, like an X Files episode. Like, each chapter was an X Files episode. And I was excited to see, like, oh, what's the next ghost or something? Because the, the ghosts themselves are, aside from the Spider Girl, are pretty creative. They have unique backstories and unique designs. The artists themselves, which I'll um, link down here in the profile, they're, they're, they're a great artist. Uh, one of the best, frankly, I've seen when it comes to this type of stuff. As far as monster design, they do a lot of stuff like this, even outside of the Deathmark series. Um, they really carry it strongly. And the writing is not the best writing in the world. It's, it's kind of simple, and it is what needs to be. So, there's no complicated backstory or slice of life stuff lowering the plot or anything it's just kind of here's the characters you understand what they are you know what mashita is you know what show is you know what they all are you don't need like them to drop the backstory they, they sometimes drop a little bit when they talk a little bit like diamond is like oh yeah you can open that door you know i, I live in a pretty old house and it's it's a small thing it's a small thing but that's a little bit of character development right there not character development like character reveal and most of the storyline is done that way, which is perfectly fine. So we're not dragged down of like, well, here's Diamond's backstory, and I have a tragic past where I help so many patients and everything, and uh, stuff like that. 
Mary's story, Mary could have gotten some more screen time in her evil form, probably. Um, and like I said, the only reason I think her thing was so short is that they're saving her. Like, they were like, well, we're gonna make a sequel. Pull her back. We need to use her again. She's gonna be a big bad. So that's all I can think of. And this is kind of a spoiler for NG. No good. But I did check out the post credit scene to see if there was another game coming after that. And um, Yashiki does appear in it. He does appear in the post credit scene. So it looks like he may have taken Mashita's offer, or at least doing it on his own to becoming a paranormal detective cop. So the third game, maybe that's going to be Yashiki and Mashita again. Who knows? But yeah, Death Mark. Very, very solid horror adventure game. Uh, it does, like I said, does have a few flaws here and there, you know, as far as like small pacing things or stuff like that. But one of the most consistent horror games I've played, anyway. But yeah, anyway, thank you all for watching me play um, or read Deathmark. I'll see you guys later, and take it easy.